Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about another top five list on why you should use Logic Pro. Today we're going to be looking at the synthesis tools, all the synthesizer options. We're going to look at the top five things that Logic brings to the table, which really help it stand apart from everything else. So watch this video. One other thing before we get started, I've noticed we're almost at 6,000 subscribers. And when I go into my analytics, it shows me how many of you have clicked that little notification bell. And only about 500 of you have. So make sure that if you're coming back and watching these videos, that you hit that notification bell so you can be notified every time I post one of these videos. We're not on a standard schedule, and so it really helps if you want to know when these come out that you click that little bell so that you can get that little message saying that a new video has come out. Okay, let's jump right into the content for this video where we talk about those, those synthesizers. So let's talk about these five things which I think really stand out with Logic Pro 10 in terms of it being a synth monster DAW. Now, first and foremost, you got to understand that so many other DAWs have tons of great synth stuff too, and there's third-party things which you can get. But I'm looking at just Logic 10 as it comes out of the initial download. Uh, after you've got all of the included content there, this is what I'm looking at. Now, you could expand what this application does by including third-party things, but that's the same with every DAW. And so I think in that way, it's pretty similar. But first and foremost, what we have is a ton of instruments, which are amazing. We have Alchemy, which they uh, purchased a few years ago and included with an update. And Alchemy alone, if that's the only instrument we had, is going to be amazing. It has so many different features, types of synthesis, everything from just straight ahead analog style subtractive synthesis to uh, we have additive synthesis, spectral synthesis, granular, it can actually be a sampler, all of this stuff built into one thing, which also, by the way, does vector type synthesis as well, because you can morph in between things. It's an amazing synthesizer. It comes with a ton of content. So here we are with everything. We have oh, almost 3,500 presets, 3,409, and you can make your own presets. It's just a great, great instrument. So that alone is probably worth the price of buying Logic. Second one for me would be Sculpture. This is another one I've used for many years. And uh, before we had... Uh, before we had anything else, this one alone was probably worth the price of Logic. It is a modeled type synthesizer, so it uses this model of a string. We can move the pickups here and where the objects are activating the string. It's attached to this whole engine where we can choose what material that string is made out of. We can attach a body to this, like a, something that, like a ukulele body that is modeled after the actual instrument. We have effects attached to this, an entire morph engine, which is amazing, and just every kind of envelope that you would ever need. Keep in mind that Logic, or Apple rather, has gotten smarter about a lot of these instruments, which are so massive, because I feel like this could easily be something where they said, you know what, to use this instrument, you need to get the newest computer. And it's going to take up all this processing so that you can't just use the older ones. Well, they have put in some of these options to help with that. So for instance, we have the high definition, the extended or the basic definition for render mode. And as I open this up, it came in as the basic so let's just check out high definition. Definitely jumped up a little bit there. But you want to keep that in mind that if you're running out of room with your processor and you're using a bunch of this type, then you might want to switch it or make sure it's on basic. And if you are doing your final render, you might switch it to high definition. But it does change the sound of it. So you want to listen to it in whichever one you're doing. 
going back for one second to alchemy. Let's see if I can click on it. Right here is the same option. So we could be doing, let's click back on the CPU meter for a second. So that one is getting about 50% at the height ultra. It's definitely flying up higher when I'm doing the chords. But even the draft, it's, it's saving, I think, a little bit. But keep in mind that you have some differences there in that setting. So they're not just forcing you to use it in the highest quality at all times. From there, we have one of the great subtractive style synthesizers, the ES2. This is straight ahead, just a great instrument. Three oscillator, two filter, and this whole matrix for routing things. You can do some really creative sounds here. On top of that, it's an entire vector synth as well. So we have a lot of stuff in here. Uh, it's a great synthesizer, has an awesome unison mode, so you can have all of the voices duplicating on um, each of the notes you're playing. <laughs> come up with some really powerful super saws in this thing. It's a great instrument. Uh, I don't think we have the same way to cut back on the processing for this, but it's not using as much as the other two anyway. It's doing a lot less. It's a lot simpler. From there, we have just about every other type of synthesizer still. We have an FM synth, which is decent. It's one of the old school ones. It's, it's okay. It's FM synth. We have an ensemble synth, a mono synth, a poly synth. We have the ES1, which for a long time was one of the de facto digital synthesizers. We have a vocoder synth, which is incredible. And I'm waiting for them to update this interface as well and some of the features. We'll see if they do. And then we have retro synth which is one of the newer ones and this has a subtractive style analog version one with a sync option we have a a table synth so this has a a, a wavetable option and then another fm synth on here too which looks kind of like a dx7 sure anyway instrument after instrument after instrument after instrument and we're not even getting to everything for instance we have ultra beat which also has a whole synthesis engine built onto it etc so the instruments are just amazing and really powerful with what you can do with them next we have the midi effects so the midi effects this would be feature number two for working with synthesizers uh, if we're working with any of these, let's pull out just a retro synth for a second. We can come through and say we want an arpeggiator or a chord trigger. Chord trigger is really interesting. One note that I trigger on the top triggers an entire chord pretty cool stuff. There's a lot of things you can do with this. Um, in addition, we have a modifier, modulator, note repeater, randomizer, scripter, transposer, velocity processor. All of these things are so cool. The one that I want to focus on for one second is the scripter, uh, which allows you to create custom effects here. It's pretty awesome. Um, we have things like a sequencer in here, so we can actually come through and have an analog-ish-esque type sequencer. Yeah. 
And it doesn't work like the arpeggiator. It definitely works more like a sequencer in the traditional sense. But we have so many different things here. We have an invert note option. I'm playing up on the keyboard. So there's just so many things you can do in addition to what we have. And you, there's people online who are creating some more of these as well. Uh, there's some pretty cool things out there. So that is the next thing would be these MIDI effects, which are so useful and can really accomplish so many things. Next, if you're not happy with what you have there, you can actually come into the environment and do a whole heck of a lot more with that. So for instance, we can come in here and we can make little knobs that control things and this can uh, be used to send MIDI or control MIDI data. We can do, uh, let's see, we have a transformer, which I use on occasion specifically to change one form of MIDI data to another. So for instance, um, if the status is some piece of data here, pitch bend, then I can change the data bytes to map to different places. It's just a really cool tool that allows me to get the exact MIDI data to the exact place that I want it. And sure, it takes some time to really master this tool, and I don't even think I have it fully mastered, but I know how to use it and when to use it in certain cases, and it gives me that additional level of control. So the environment is a huge thing on the list. From there, we have external instruments. And this is going to tie into number five. So this is four and five. Uh, let's load up. Let's take off the scripter here. Let's load up an instrument. That's the external instrument. So my MIDI goes out whichever port I have. So if I want to go out my Steinberg UR22 Mark II, I can hook that up to one of my hardware synthesizers. Take the input. If I hook up in my bigger system with the multiple inputs, then I can incorporate that synthesizer directly into my project. Also has auto compensate latency, which we'll, we can look at in a minute, but that's going to test the loop and adjust for the instrument so that whatever the delay is, it'll push other things around the project. Now, there is some stuff about this. Latency seems to be a hot topic with logic not always being accurate or not always acting predictable, sometimes being buggy. But I have found in nine times out of 10 when I'm doing things just a straight ahead way that doesn't seem to be an issue. Now, this ties into uh, the IDAM protocol. Now, I've got this instrument on my iPhone. This is KQ Dixie, which is a DX7, uh, well, essentially a clone for iPhone and iPad. And I've got like that bass sound, the original DX7 bass that got used on 100 or, you know, 500 records back when this first was released. And I want to be able to use this sound sometimes. Sure, it's a little bit nostalgic in a way. But it's on my phone, so I'm going to come out and we're going to hook up my phone with the IDAM protocol, audio MIDI setup. Now we're going to lose visuals probably because um, we don't have the ability to screen capture and do everything all simultaneously. But inside the audio devices of my audio MIDI setup, my phone, it's connected to the computer with its cable. Okay, so once that is enabled, I have MIDI input and output over here and the audio device here. What this means is that I can now record audio straight from my phone. I can have it go right into Logic. And over here, because this shows up in the MIDI studio, I've got MIDI back and forth. So I can send MIDI to my phone and also get MIDI from my phone. So the MIDI's two-way, the audio just comes from the phone. Once we have that, I can come over here and you'll see I can now do MIDI destination iPhone, input one and two. Playing my MIDI keyboard attached to Logic, the MIDI's going through Logic to my phone, triggering that DX7 clone. 
and then the sound is coming in on my track. I can record this. I can actually use MIDI effects with it. So here's an arpeggiator. Okay, I digress. But that sound is coming from my phone, not from inside Logic as an instrument. That's a really cool way to work and be able to incorporate mobile devices into my, my session here. And that's another synthesizer, which I have on my phone. Costs like, I don't know, four or five bucks or something. And now I've got access to that digital version incorporated with all of the Logic stuff happening. So not only can I do this with my bigger analog, actual analog synthesizers, but I can also do this with my mobile device and all the synths that are on there as well. Okay, that's the five things that I consider to be of utmost value when it comes to the world of synthesis inside Logic 10. Probably there's a few of you who have other things that you prefer. Make sure you leave those in the comments below and share some of the things that you're thinking about. It's probably hard to dispute that some of the things I talked about are a value, but it may be outside your top five. But definitely share and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can come back. We're going to be doing a number of these top five things over the next couple of weeks. It's just one of those things I've been thinking about and wanting to focus on. And so make sure you hit that notification bell so you can see when those videos come out. Okay, that's it. Hope you're having a great week and we'll have another video soon.